Janelle was a very gifted athlete. Even in sixth grade when we had field day, he was one of those kids that just shined. Well, he was an exceptional athlete. You just give him the ball. Just toss it to him and get out of his way, basically. Or we, I mean, we blocked for him. We, I don't mean just we stood and watched him. We played with him. But you open a hole for him. Or if you didn't, he'll make one. His sixth grade year, I went from calling him Trinnell Walker to just touchdown Walker. It seemed like almost every time he touched the ball, he was going for a touchdown. I've never seen anybody like him. That it, it just, you know, on film, you watching uh, our game from Friday night on Saturday morning and grading film, you know, you just couldn't keep your eyes off of him when he was in the ball game. Chanel was a young man that was very, very, very active at church, very popular young man, um, a young man with a smile. Uh, Trinnell always had a smile on his face. I mean, it's almost like his smile went from, from ear to ear. He, you know, he was such a pleasant young man to be around. I'm thankful that I didn't have any problems like most parents do with their kids, you know. They've never got in, got in any trouble, and a lot of people, when I would see them, they say, you have such polite kids. And I'm like, who, my kid? Yes, sir, uh, no, sir type young man. Um, very respectful, uh, which is the way he's taught at church and at home, and um, a good student. He uh, excelled, you know, on the athletic field, but he also took care of his uh, work in the classroom. Uh, we pretty much kept to ourselves. We didn't party. We didn't smoke like the other kids or do any tobacco and nothing. I mean, everything was football. We just we weren't like the kids today, nothing was video games. We always wanted to be outside. Money was not, it was growing off trees. So we'd always have the old Monterey, I think you what, 12 of them for a couple bucks. That's what we always ate. And Mom would actually get home finally and say, no boys, this is how you do it. You gotta put a slice of cheese over it. Pop in the microwave, milk and cheese, and mm, it's pretty good. It's lit, lots of, lots of bread. And the things I like to do was wrestle. And the reason why I like to wrestle because it gave us something to do. I like football because that was like my brother's favorite sport. So naturally it became mine too. And running, it was just natural to me. Uh, obviously I've seen uh, many injuries happen. Uh, concussions. People completely knocked out. There's always uh, the uh, shoulder and neck uh, issues that you have. Um, the collisions on the sideline, driving a guy to bounds, and you know sometimes even into the equipment on the sidelines. I mean, I always ask myself the question: What would I do? Would I run and scream? Would I go into shock? Or how would I react to something if he got hurt? Well. I went in the shop and I stood there for a minute because when it hit, I mean, it's, it's just like a, 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 a bunch of rounds just colliding together. You know, that's just the sound that, that has stuck in my head. And I watched him unfold and when he got to the bottom, he, he wasn't up. It's a way I don't even like to watch those replays. I don't even watch that anymore. I, don't, I, I close my eyes and if I catch it, I'm, I'm not happy. What I guess my brother didn't see is the defensive end coming from the other side. The running back seen him, so you could tell that the running back kind of ducked and dipped into the hole to fall down and keep from getting hit. And when he did, it went from here to exposing my brother's head. And that's loud pop. It was a blitz, man. And I remember him hitting Mark Lowe. They was going for the quarterback. When he hit Mark and he hit the ground, the way he was laying, you know, it was, it was weird. And I remember walking up to him, telling him, get up, man, we was losing. And he said, he can't move. And I walked around and looked, I walked in front of him, I'm like, man, get up, get up.
why would he get hurt like that, man? He worked hard. He did everything right. He was a good person. Never did nothing wrong to nobody. Never got in fights. Never got kicked out of classes. <sighs> this makes you wonder, man, why? Bad stuff happened to the good people. I guess the best way to put it is my job was to protect him. Ah, that's what makes it so hard. He, he was motionless, and I'd never seen that. You know, I've seen kids get tackled and knocked down, and, you know, they just start coming around and get up, but Turnell wasn't going to get up. And it was when I, when I saw Terry waving for that ambulance, I knew that it was something really serious. The train it, it knew something was wrong, and immediately everybody took a knee, and that Turnell wasn't breathing. And... I mean, that's how serious the situation was, and it... When the word came that it was Trinnell and he wasn't moving, I mean, the, the uh, stadium was a total silence. After they put him on the stretcher, tied him down real good, we, they put him in the back of the ambulance. And as they were putting him in the back of the ambulance, you know, I looked down at him, I'm like, man, what's going on? And he looked at me with... You know, with sadness in his eyes, cause you know he don't like to let me down, and I, I mean, that's my, that's my boy, you know. And he looked at me with a few tears in his eyes. He's like, "Bro," he said, "I think I broke my back, man." He said, "I can't feel my legs." So after the game, or before the game, I mean, as soon as it happened, I knew. So I left. <laughs> Went to the hospital and. Artez was there and he told me he couldn't feel anything, which already, already knew. I remember being out in the hallway and talking to one of the doctors who had examined him and he said that x-rays that he took indicated that his spinal column had either been partially or completely severed. So they called us to the back room. I believe Marvel was with us. And the doctor came in and told us he had shattered his C4 vertebrae and something about the sixth vertebrae that was lined into his spine. But he was showing us on the x-ray where the fourth vertebrae was supposed to be. And there was nothing there but space. He said it shattered like a piece of glass. And so we, he was laying there, you know, we was talking to him, just telling him, you know, kind of go take one step at a time and see what's going on here because we don't know what it is. Uh, and he looked up at us and said, well, hey, Mom, I guess it's why you tell us to wear clean underwear. We like, huh? Yeah, you know, my mom always said, if you get in an accident, you know, you should always be wearing clean underwear. What? <laughs> Cause she would always tell us, no matter what you do, bathe you, bathe you, take a bath, and put on clean underwear. Cause you never know when you might end up in the hospital. You, ne you just never know, you know. And they came, came into play, and we were laughing about that. <laughs> we, we were laughing about it. It was pretty funny. <laughs> I knew I was gonna be paralyzed, but in my mind. I thought it was only I was only gonna be temporary. So I was ain't gonna lie, I was in denial. My friends would come over once I left Bader, you know, talking to me. And I'd be like, man, hey, I'm gonna be up with y'all running around in like a couple of years, you know, maybe one or two years. Not realizing that it wasn't gonna happen. He had friends, you know, but at that age, you know a lot will fall off because they don't understand what's going on. They still want to run around and chase the girl, you know. And he lost a lot of them. You can't fault them, you know, because they were all young. I didn't want to accept the fact 
that I would never go running around with my friends again. I would never, ever be able to hug my mom again. The simple things I would never, ever be able to do again. It was hard. It was so hard that I got angry. And everybody felt my anger, including God. I began to question my faith. I, I just couldn't uh, come to terms with the fact that I, how, how would God allow something like this to happen to such a, an incredible young man? It just took everything out of you. I mean, you just, I just didn't have any energy. I, didn't, I mean, I was just kind of lost, just got in a daze. Just... And it still bothers me. All I did was play football. I didn't, wasn't a womanizer, I went out there stealing. I wasn't doing anything. I was just playing the game I loved. So I was mad at God. And then during that whole denial thing, I also started being like, hey, okay, God, this happened to me. I started bargaining with God. I'm like, all right, God, you know, I know, hey, if I have the faith the size of a mustard seed, that, you know, you can make things happen. I mean, you can move mountains. And if you make me walk again, hey, I'll be your ace. I'll be your number one. Nothing happened. I grew up in church. So I'm like, if there ain't a God, there is a devil. Devil. You make me walk again, hey, I'll, hey, I'll, I'll do anything you say. You can use me. Nothing happened. Then came depression. I saw the signs. And you got to understand, from his accident to coming back home, he was able to go to school, finish high school. High school was over. He didn't have a schedule anymore. He was just home. His classmate done graduated, just like he did. They were going on to college, going on to do their life. He was at home. So he was faced with a crossroad in his life. I knew that. I knew if he continued just stay at home, he was waiting to go to Grayson County. I was depressed for a good two and a half to three years. And during that time, I wanted to die. I was hopeless. I was helpless. I didn't see any reason for me to live. He was so depressed, he, he, he wished he was dead, you know. He just, he just didn't care, you know. It wasn't nothing, I can't do nothing no more. It's, it's nothing that I can do for myself. And he just, he just wanted to give up. He could have easily been put in the nursing home. A lot of people do do their family members like that. But that's just not how we, that's just not how it goes with us. That, that's not going to happen. I think a lot of people do that. I mean, that is the easier road to take. Trinell's brother, Artes, made a sacrifice. He left his college, he left his university to go take care of Trinell. I understand this because I'm a caretaker too, and you can't not be involved if it's family. You have to get in there, roll up your sleeves, and do some dirty work. And it may, it may be sleepless nights, it may be cleaning things off the floor that you don't desire to do, but that's, that's what family does. And it's an example of legacy. And I think the question is, what do you want your legacy to be? Zig Ziglar talked about the absence of unconditional love really affects the life of a person, who they become, and what they're capable of doing. The real currency of life is love. That's where you earn your real certificates of appreciation, is by investing, serving, and loving others. One night, with tears rolling down my face, I finally did what my mom encouraged me to do since the beginning, since I was a kid, since I was young, and that was to pray. The night with tears rolling down my face, I was like, Jesus, 
come into my life and have your way. And I'll never forget this moment. My eyes closed shut. And I had this peace that passed and all understanding overcome me. I heard a tender voice say, Trinell, you put football before me. I don't want anything put before me. But through this injury, I'm inspire others that if they put me first and use their mind to the fullest, they can do anything. At that point, I realized that my purpose was bigger than playing football. My purpose was go out there and inspire others to persevere, to have hope, to have courage. I do know that God allows things to happen and He has a plan. And the plan is always a good plan. And when you look at the people who change the world, when you look at the people who make the biggest difference in the lives of others, they all have in their own way that event that they don't understand, that circumstance. It could be a broken home, it could be an addiction, it could be an accident, it could be a disease, it could be where they're born in the world. And yet, God uses them to change the lives of others. He's been able to help a lot of people, whether they have a disability or not. I lost my way, but what got me back on track was Trinell. He, he seemed to never leave, lose faith uh, in God and in his spirituality. And seeing him handling it the way he did, it helped me get mine back. Things happen in your life and there'll be obstacles but God still has a plan for your life and whatever that plan is, you figure that out and then you get after it. I never would have dreamt Trinell would be where he is today. You know, doing what he's doing today and how successful he is, you know, it's just, a, uh, it's amazing to, to see, to be honest with you. It just tells you the, the drive and the character. And So to me, that tells me that he has always had God in his life. And uh, so he believes if, if God is with you, everything is possible. Trinell's athleticism was not his strong suit. You know, God still gave him uh, the talent he has and probably what the, the biggest talent he had is just as a person and the drive that he has to succeed. And really that's what makes Trinell so unique. He has an experience that you can learn from. You know, you just get around him and you're like, wow, I thought I had problems. And then when you talk to him, he creates hope and you see, when you have hope and passion, those fuel a thing called grit. And grit is that unwavering, undeterred determination to develop your discipline and your gifts and talents. And when you combine hope and passion and grit, uh, that's what I call the trifecta or the trinity of transformation. And that's what Trinell brings. I really think that Trinell can do amazing things, even outside of Angels of Care. And I think that there is a lot of people out there that Trinell can help. People that are struggling, and it doesn't have to be with a spinal cord injury. It's any struggle, financial, you know, hardships, thought process things that people need help with, that Trinell can play a huge part in helping people live better lives and overcome tragedy, overcome bad times. If he can do it, certainly you encouraged to, to, to do it. I have the privilege of two or three times a month of being able to have a call with Trinell. And he thinks that I'm coaching him. And the reality is, is I'm being coached by him. Because I'll say, how is this going? How is your book progressing? How is this initiative? And he'll start telling me. And as he tells me what he's telling and what he's planning, I get inspired because it brings me back to the roots of what I consider to be the most valuable thing of all, and that is, how can we help God's children be all that God created them to be? I enjoy the relationships, because life will be hard to live without the relationship. I wouldn't be in front of you now without the relationship of family, without the relationship I have with friends, without the relationship I have with Strangers who have become family. I've learned to enjoy this life. It's not about what I can physically do. It's about what I can do to influence people to be the best they can be and do. Just like scripture says, he that's greatest among you must be servant of all. 
that's one of the things that I've learned from then and there. And plus, like my mom said, as long as you have your mind, you can do anything. And I like to add to that, as long as you take that knowledge and apply what you have in your mind to make your life better as well as somebody else, all things are possible to him or her who can really believe. If you're struggling with a similar situation, have hope and persevere. Because once you have hope, you have the ability to realize that this is only temporary and the best is yet to come. And when you have are able to persevere, no matter what your obstacles are, you're able to break through them because you don't give up. You continue to strive. You continue to be determined. You can continue to pursue your dreams and your goals. I'm a living testimony that as long as you have hope, because I've been hopeless, as long as you have that desire to be determined, because I felt helpless, as long as you're able to tell yourself if it's to me, it's up to be, you can get through this. It's not going to be easy. Life isn't easy. But once you make up your mind to say, hey, I can do this. Others will see that you can do it. And they'll be more, they'll be more than happy to help you get through whatever it is that you're going through. Just look at me. I'm paralyzed from the neck down. The only thing I can use are my shoulders. But I've been able to have a high school diploma. I've been able to go to college and get a bachelor's degree in rehabilitation studies, a master's degree in rehabilitation counseling. I am a certified rehabilitation counselor. I'm a Ziegler Legacy certified trainer. I'm also a corporate trainer for Angels of Care Pediatric Home Health. Look at me. I'm no different than you are. I just made a decision to take action to be resilient, to encourage myself, to never quit, to evaluate, to learn, and to love, regardless of what I've experienced. And I encourage you to do the same. It's impossible to stop a motivated person because he or she will never quit. So whenever you're feeling like you want to quit, you can always do a little bit more. 